Welcome to another TMG interview. My name is Paul Preston, talking to the writer, producer, director, and more of a new film now available streaming all over the place. That's Apple TV, Prime Video, Google Play, YouTube, and if you're a cheapskate and you want to watch it for free, you can even do that on Tubi and the Roku channel. So really, there's no excuse for you to miss Boy Makes Girl. And here to talk about it, Mark Elias, everybody. The crowd goes mad. How's it going? <laughs> uh, okay, you have a ton of credits in this film, so obviously you are the guy who to tell us what this film is about more than I. So please give us a story of Boy Makes Girl. It is a science fiction love story. Um, I think the heart of it is an examination of artificial intelligence and the role that it can play both positive and negative in our society as it is very much something that is real and immediate. Um, but on the fun side, it is uh, a guy who has a social struggles and he creates a lifelike version of his childhood therapist and that relationship starts to develop and evolve and he's a bit on the autism spectrum, which it can be determined in a lot of different ways, but uh, he struggles to keep up with her as she becomes more and more human and um, so it's kind of you know good sci-fi I think holds a mirror to society and tells us something about ourselves and so I think that this is a, a pretty poignant reflection maybe on where we are right now with some of the stuff that we're dealing with with artificial intelligence yeah I think science fiction is fiction but behind it all are facts or more so truths yeah, like you say, about the human condition. Because this is a fun movie to watch if you wanted to see an awkward guy try and handle the world and he can't anymore, so he creates someone who he can actually talk to, and then he struggles with that. That's all entertaining. But then there's also, of course, the idea of you, you handle themes of loneliness, of overwhelming technology, and all that. So where is the place you started when you were writing it? Was it like, hey, let's make this fun, and then it got deeper, or you're like, I wanted to tell the big picture, and then found the vehicle for it? I think that I think initially I was just I'm fascinated with artificial intelligence and I well don't, this is your day this <laughs> is your time <laughs> maybe not in the impending doom kind of way that we're now sort of truly facing and I I don't have a desire to tell a story about robots attacking the robot apocalypse because the Terminator did that already um, but it was more of what's what would a real relationship be. And some of these stories you hear about people that even now they have these, they could, they're developing relationships with this inanimate object that looks very much like a human. And some of the things that you are seeing that are coming out of, especially Japan, it, it's already pretty real that these talking humanoid robots. They're just, they just look for sex though, right? Come on. They're just for sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, so I, I was fascinated with that and like trying to just really look into like what that could be like and, and what is the line between robot and human when there's, you might have certain social, like I was very socially awkward and had certain um, hindrances when I was younger that I had to learn to overcome to sort of fit in and read people's facial cues from a younger age when I don't think that was probably, it was probably inherent for more other people more so than myself. And so feeling like alienated and feeling a little bit like almost a robot and the irony of what that's like for somebody who would be in a relationship with a robot that then can learn and and upgrade so the story kind of came from that seed of like what a real relationship with ai would be like and not something that turns into some fantastical uh, robot apocalypse uh if that makes sense yeah there's something about robots that event essentially i don't know make us feel like the story's going to be about loneliness because they're struggling to find something and when a human can't do it i mean that's just I mean, you found a niche here because I think in sci-fi romance, you've got her, right? Right. The, but there's no body. You've got uh, Lars and the Real Girl, but there's no talking or personality. Right. So this is it. This is the, what you want if you want the whole package of a brand new story tackling this kind of thing. Yeah. And, you know, there's other, there's other things that kind of... I think her was a big one. Lars and the Real Girl showed that you could do a lot more than most people probably thought. Um, that uh, that movie really achieved it. There was one years ago, I'm thinking probably 2014, and it was called, jeez, uh, it was this Duplass Brothers movie, uh, Safety Not Guaranteed. And that was 
a, a journalist finds an uh, an ad that somebody said seeking somebody to travel in the future, right? So it's, and they're like, this guy's got to be crazy. And they go and they visit him and it, it's, you know, it's Duplass Brothers, so it's, they can do what they want, but it was a drama, but it had this science fiction element to it that made it different and interesting. And I, I saw, seeing that and you go, there's, there's a path to tell successful stories that's been done it's hard to do, but when you have the opportunity, like this movie was crowdfunded and we were really specific about, we're gonna make a movie that it might not fit into one genre perfectly, or, you know, it has elements of comedy and drama in it. We we were afforded the ability to do that because of the way we set out from the start. Like we're crowdfunding it. This is something we're really gonna stick to. Um, we're not gonna make just a zombie robot genre film that anybody else can make it was really specific and what we we set out for yeah and i noticed if i'm not mistaken aaron our lead character doesn't use contractions a choice right right I definitely knows that and then it, what's interesting is later on i noticed emma does so she's almost out humaned aaron as she involves she says i i you know i want to go to the dance school or something like that she says and i'm like oh she's like, using contract but Aaron can't even do that. Right. Like it's just showing you how quick technology can catch up, even in a you know a fictional story. And that was that was intentional. I'm glad that that you kind of caught that because that was part of the evolution of her learning process. And he learns by the end to use contractions as well as something he's learned from her. But you have to kind of build in those, I think, visual or audio benchmarks for this type of a character because a lot of it is so internalized like for me um i remember saying like explaining to um to somebody how especially when i'm in an uncomfortable situation and i walk into a room the first thing my mind does is find a pattern like there's three rows of four uh lights in the ceiling and my my brain prefers even numbers to odd numbers it feels more comfortable for real this is you yeah this is the things you go through when you walk into a room Yes, if it's an, I mean, You're not, not alone my living sure. room, yeah, yeah. but like but yeah. a, a, an uncomfortable situation, um, and that's something that is all great and it uh, for and in the lines of the character. But when you're doing this in a movie, you have to choose visual cues and audio cues that tell that story. So, Let part me just of it say, was can that. I interrupt to just say thank you for that? Because uh, too many there's a plague in Hollywood screenwriters right now of overwriting, too much explanation. Yeah. If you, if the cue is visual and audio. You know, like points, because that's much more interesting for the viewer of the film to decipher and engage in than explaining everything. You know, there's no monologue where your character goes, you know, I like to feel, you know, like he doesn't right. explain his whole deal. You just show it, show don't tell. It's an old adage, but it's rare in major films today. But in indies like yours, you know, we find it. Uh, yeah, th I think it's one thing that we're afforded with indie films is you have that ability to acknowledge like the intellect of the audience. Like they're gonna pick up on that. I mean, even if they don't, there's still the to overall story to be told. But when you when you handle it with sort of intellect and delicacy, like it's there for people that want to pick it up. Why can't we do that uh, in feature films? <laughs> you know, because honestly, sometimes I've seen you know the trend now where like the best writing is TV, long form television. Sometimes, but right. some of the great stuff, you know, people wouldn't see House of Cards on the level they did if it was in the theaters. And I wonder why that is. I don't know. If I, you don't have to have the answer for me, but I'll let it hang there and we can feel uncomfortable. I love that. I love <laughs> I'm embracing the discomfort. Yeah, or Breaking Bad or you name it, you know, like the writing is so good. Uh, well, Breaking Bad is the kind of movie people might go and see, but, you know, for like a good drama with good... Uh, writing and good filmmaking like like that with show don't tell it's hard to get people out sometimes to the theater to do that i wonder if it's a fear uh, like a fear-based thing of this needs to be a, this benchmark film so we don't have time for you know it's all we need to have x amount of explosions and these kind of things and there's no how much character development is there really and, and that kind of thing um I think you're right. Executives running scared, yeah. playing from playing catch up on yeah. what they think people need second guessing, and and then giving only these certain things to audiences, and then that's the audience was come to expect. So when they try and give them something good, they go, "No, we we're used to the other stuff." You right. know what I mean, it's a yeah, it's such a shame. But thank God for indies. Yeah. So always. Uh, well, then in this story, there's Ben. Now Ben is the uh, well, he has no problem communicating. Let's just say. <laughs> uh, uh, nice foil for uh, the character of Aaron. 
almost forcing him to be in the moment in every situation that he's in where Aaron would rather explain his feelings in a robotic tone and Ben sort of like makes him have to have conversations. And he's played by legendary character actor Paul Dooley. Paul Dooley. Legend. So uh, how did you get him involved? That was a stroke of luck. Stony Westmoreland is a genius with connecting people and he just has the ability to charm anyone into doing a film for next to nothing um we no he he went to him and he was like this is the guy and so we went to him and he liked the script and that was kind of it like it just was somebody who liked the script and wanted to do it and wanted to work and then we also got john billingsley who was on 100 episodes of star trek enterprise who liked a script and wanted to do it because of the script and so I, I I think that the short answer is we got lucky because a lot of times if you go through somebody's agent, there's just – it's too many hoops to jump through. I mean, I think – I'm pretty sure an agent's job is to not answer the emails or the phone <laughs> at all. So if you don't find a way around that, you it's just another hoop to jump through. Uh, we got really lucky. And Paul Dooley, I mean <laughs> – I think he was like 91 at the time we shot this and he would be there till 11 o'clock at night. Like we would shoot him out and hey, Paul, you can go home. And he wanted to stick around. He wanted to, you know, give my character the lines from, from his side of the camera. So it was, cause I'm sure he loves this impressive. shit, right? He loves it. It was, and, and you know, he probably gets tiny parts offered to him and small roles and things. And here's like a big meaty part. Of course he, you know, he probably wants to jump up board and have some fun, especially when you're 91 and who knows, who else is calling? Right. You and know? What? I love that's my kind of 91. Like, East, <laughs> Eastwood's making a new movie. The yeah. guy's 93. He's like, he's always said, I just don't let the old man in. And then he <laughs> goes about his business like he's 60 or whatever. Like, he doesn't that's doesn't great. address it, doesn't act like it. That's great. And, uh, you know, that's a way different 93 than, like, my hometown. Or, <laughs> or 91, in Paul Dooley's case. It's like, I know tons of people who were done at, like, 65. <laughs> and oh, Paul man. Dooley just was energetic and funny and hilarious with Sharp. a lot of those lines. Yeah, and what and that's such a great... I, I really enjoyed writing that character because the dynamic of those two, like... For me, I'm always fascinated by interesting relationships. And this was such an interesting, weird relationship that I you don't see a lot, and it totally works because when you drop Paul Dooley into that, he's so at ease with who he is that it, it's a, it became a great dynamic, I think, for the opposite, the contrast of what Aaron was. So him as that person also completely made that role work in his own way, which I didn't anticipate. I just know, wow, we can get him. He's great. He could do it. And, 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 and he was above and beyond, I guess. Not that I didn't expect him to be great. I just, when it was happening in real time, you were like, oh, this is fun <laughs> yeah and this is paul dooley and uh, you know he couldn't have asked for more that's cool yeah uh speaking of actors in your film uh the girl of boy makes girl is played by megan holloway which is crazy for me to see because megan and i were both teachers at an acting school back in the mid 2000s and so that's how i met her and it's always weird when you see someone who you've met then come into another circle of people you met a totally different way but now they all kind of know each other that's so funny yeah, yeah. i did a but play she's, she's good with her Oh, cool. Play reading or something. We were in the same theater company and then we stayed in touch and she was, she came in to read, like we asked her to audition and it was down to her and like one or two other people. But we, it was kind of that thing where, you know, in the back of your mind, like she's right for what we're going for. She's just, she's de like, she, one thing for me is like, she's dependable. You know who she is. She's a pro. She's not yeah. going to show up and whatever it was. So you that's just that extra safety when you're wearing multiple hats or it's like a low budget project where you just need to get 12 pages done in a day. That's not a person that's going to hold you back. That's a person that'll arguably accelerate the process. So that was, it kind of checked every box. I think for us, like across the board, we were like, she's, she's the one, she's great. She's, we lo love her. So it just was a no brainer at, at that point. And what's funny is you and I met through acting class, uh, Meisner oh, class, yes, right? Yes. So I think when we first met each other, and it's interesting because a lot of the conversations you have with Emma feel like Meisner repetition, you know, <laughs> where she just says angry, and you want to go angry, and we got we to repeat this until, uh, and you'll be happy to, Aaron's happy to, because he doesn't have anything else to say. Yeah. So I was <laughs> wondering if that was just good, the whole movie's going to be like 20 minutes of, uh, you know. It's just giving you PTSD. Scared, yeah. scared angry, <laughs> yeah. angry, happy, it was crazy. But, um, 
Now, Megan also knew my late wife, uh, Karen Volpe, and anyone following the Movie Guys has no doubt seen Karen in any number of videos, podcasts, and tons more at themovieguys.net. Um, and I, Boy Makes Girl, I believe, marks her final performance. Um, she plays a singer in the background of a cafe scene, not a huge role or anything, but um, she passed in 2019, but keeps putting out new projects. I keep I'm calling her like she's Tupac. I just want to say that. <laughs> right? So she's, <laughs> but I think this is it. But I mean, who knows? If something will pop up that she did something else. But uh, but I ain't mad about that. So I was happy to see her there. And and she was. I mean, it was a. I don't know if it's just because we know her or know the circumstances, but that moment of her playing guitar in the background was an extra level of sweetness that that scene, it really embraced and brought more out of that scene. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I, you really felt like this is just an extra added layer of sweetness and emotion to that part of the film. Um, Cause that's it nice was like you say. the yeah, ending and that's scene. An emotional song too. Yeah. Like she, she wanted to play something original, so she didn't want to like play something you guys have to sweat copyrights or anything. So the song she picked was this one about somebody dying, and I was like, "Yeah, okay." And, she just, and now after yeah. the fact, you look back at it and you go, "Oh, that is uh, sort of haunting and sweet and Prophetic, beautiful at the same yeah. time." <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but uh, I, I thank you for using her in the film, uh, and I know she was thrilled about it. Uh, but let's talk about a whole stable of actors you have because you use them over and over again. You made a f- previous film called Golden Boy. And this is something that happens on the indie level all the time. We talked about Paul Osborne, actually, before we got on yeah. the air, who like is the mayor of film festivals. And turns out you've worked with him. Yep, sure, and so have I. And if you know this guy, go check out his work, Favor, Official Rejection, a documentary about film festivals, which is fascinating. His new film is Fluorescent Beast, and we'll get to that in a second. But... Um, yeah, he uses the same staple of people. You see Patrick Day, Blaine Weaver, all these other actors in his films. Okay. And so and this goes right on up to like Adam Sandler and Martin Scorsese using the same people. But returning champs to Boy Meets Girl from uh, Golden Boy include the great Sean O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, Sean O'Brien, going back to our Meisner class where I met him too, just appeared in a great scene with Brad Pitt in Babylon. Yeah. Uh, so he'll get in like the big time stuff, but loves and is happy to do indie and i'll see him in anything so yeah, he's great right i mean you can i it's like you can write something and in your head it makes sense and you know people most people are gonna be like i don't get this and then you're <laughs> like sean o'brien will, <laughs> sean o'brien will make it work he's yeah. just malleable in the way that you can you can throw anything at him and even if it probably doesn't make sense <laughs> he, he'll pull it off in a way where you go oh no, no it's, 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 like it's sean like he can he can pull off anything. So very lucky to have met him uh, and and then worked with him. And, and he, I got to get him on and hopefully the next thing I make too. I can imagine. But, uh, the, here's what I thought went down. I could be wrong. But you can see why this theory would probably be right. Where you say, hey, you play this oxy dealer and you're in your pool. And he goes, can I be naked? <laughs> Am I right? Do I have that right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I th- I'm, I would say that there's a good possibility that that's exactly how it went <laughs> yeah. down. The details are a little fuzzy because of how much we were shooting, but it's like y- there would be no, there would be, n- I feel like there'd be nothing he wouldn't do or want to do in the moment. So yeah, he wanted to be naked. Which made him a great Meisner actor, right? So good, yeah. yeah. And Patricia Meisen, do I pronounce that name correctly? Yes. Uh, she, uh, it, yeah, so she's on board your projects as an actress and a producer, correct? Yes. How do you work with her? How did you meet her? That's a great question. I don't even remember. I met her maybe through a friend, and she was part of the crowdfunding team. Um, and, uh, yeah, she was part of our crowdfunding team and then came on board, and you kind of write something that is right for her or something that you go, I know that we can push her in this direction because she's easy to direct. So it, it was kind of one of those things that you're just like, yeah, she, she's been along for the ride. She's kind of part of the team. She comes in and she, you know, you direct her a little bit and she finds exactly what you need and you just kind of keep going. So, and I think I have this right in golden boy. She was more matronly. Was she like a mother or sister or something in that? She was like, uh, she was um, sort of a housewife that had some low key kind of dealings that she was kind of, she was drug dealing drugs, buying drugs. Okay, um, so yeah, that 
that's uh, but still a bit of a cry from what she does here. So I was impressed with her uh, yeah. her ability to shift into a threatening thief. Yeah, in this one. So that's cool. Good, good for her. Keep the keep the the gang close, you know, for whatever your next project is, and we'll talk about that in a second too. But I want to shout out to the tech side of things. Uh, first of all, the score is excellent um, because it kind of comes on with a little sci-fi vibe, but then it's not afraid to pull back to piano and other things when the moments are more emotional. And uh, so who are we celebrating with that score? Um, Alejandro Villanueva, who is based in both, I think, Los Angeles and Mexico City. You know, we were dealing with some of this post during COVID, so it, a lot of it was so virtual. But we I found him randomly and the stuff you, you just, I, he then sent me like his Spotify and he makes literally his own music like on Spotify. So I was blown. Like, I just had no idea what, like, cause it's one of those movies where you're just like, what exactly is the right balance here? Because it's not one, it's not just like one genre. Let's go right to sci-fi and that's it. It was, it's got this emotional heart and needs to be handled delicately. And he just kind of, from the start, you're like, this is exactly like, I don't remember ever thinking mm, it's not quite right. Like it was, I mean, we just, everything he gave us just dropped right in. You're like, this is exactly what we <laughs> needed. I mean, this dude is super talented. Like he should, uh, you know, I want to use him for everything. I hope he gets bigger projects too, because he's so talented. Cool. I mean, and for anyone who doesn't know how this works, you shoot the whole thing and then he layers in the score. Uh, afterwards right right so, so he just sees it and knows it and yeah i mean you get an edit it. to him that's fairly tight edit so it, the, he knows the they can get the feel of the pace and all that and then they get the opportunity to sit through sit and feel i i would assume sit watch it feel through it and then go away and create for a while and then they come back with this incredibly amazing score <laughs> That's cool. And also on the visual side, the, I think the photography is really good, but even more so is the sublime combo you have between the photography and the visual effects, which are, I think, punching a little bit above their weight class. Um, <laughs> there's a, because, you know, it could look hacky as hell at, at this you know, budget level, but I think all the on-screen graphics and the numbers that kind of show up and the text that kind of turns into emojis or something that filter a scene, uh, all play real well and in above photography that's uh, very good as well yeah that was that, I, that wasn't a question i guess but a lot <laughs> no, was... i realized when i was done i never asked a question but if there's a compliment what do you think <laughs> uh, I, thank you for the compliment i think we it was a it was a tough call because you're making this like indie film and for me when you make a low budget indie film i'm very much like don't ever try and make it seem like it's a big movie because you're lying to the audience like embrace what you have embrace the low budget aspect so the vfx had to be done smartly and i think delicately and so there was a couple moments where we're like this movie could have vfx throughout but if you you can maximize the little ones that you do do to make a difference and enhance the story and so we kind of settled on that um but i mean you like you layer great vfx on a poorly shot film you've seen it before it doesn't it doesn't fix it like we had you know our dp was great the the whole crew really did, was amazing you know our art girl she was just blew it out of the water and so when those like, vfx just sprinkle on the extra goodness oh i thought i mean but talking about art direction because i love the look of the garage too like it has yeah. a, that has a full sci-fi feel and then every time you go outside of it it's the real world yeah you know but that sort of blue and the dark and the lights are you know, kind of bright and uh, when they're like string lights around your chairs and desks, you know, just kind of give it a, a sort of otherworldly feel. Yeah. But it's still in the real world once he goes out in the alley. Yeah. Katie Powers was was our was our art direction. I mean, she did everything and it was really. Wait a minute. Actress Katie Powers? <laughs> yeah. Correct. Who's in the film too, right? Or no? Do I yes, have that right? she has a yeah. role in the film okay. also. I yeah. thought so. From our class. Look at you dipping into the well. Good job. <laughs> I no, you <laughs> She's so good. Yeah, and yeah. it was one of those things. For me, I think part of maybe what I've learned through this is like, I'm very much like, I will watch a movie no matter what the budget level, if it's a great story. I don't need to, I'm not going to like vilify a film for not having that sweeping, you know, skyline shot or something. And so for me, I didn't realize really, I think at the time, maybe what well done 
simple, smartly thought out camera movement, art direction, lighting can really add to a film that makes it something memorable. Like that was something I wasn't really, I'm more of just like, I love something even if it's handheld, as long as the sound is good and the story's good and the acting is good. And then you see these little things that were added that just when you see the film, like we had somebody, I think you a producer friend who had said like, read the script, there's no way you can make this for the budget that you guys have. And then he saw what it was done. He's like, it looks like a million dollar film. I'm like, two years ago, you said that this couldn't be done for pennies. So we, it's a testament to everybody that worked on it, that believed in it and brought the fullest of their talents to really enhance those things that, that needed to be enhanced. This is one of my favorite things when talking about indie films, stories from the trenches. What went wrong and you had to pivot or you had to double down or make a change or something uh, because uh, they don't go 100% right. Was there a uh, location that flew south, the actor didn't show up, anything? Well, we, f we didn't get one scene that was pretty pivotal that we needed. Luckily, we, like, I think, so we had shot it in 13 days and then, Day 14 was, you guys, we didn't get the scene. We got a camera. We got the other actor. I think it was just the two lead actors in that garage. We went back. We shot that thing, luckily, before we had completely forgotten. It was a bit of a pivotal scene in the film that you couldn't just cut out. Um, that was a big one. Uh, you know, I think every film you're also for it's just best to know it's not good or bad anymore you just have to know it is there's always going to be like probably one person that doesn't want to be there or they just are a problem and so I think that's something you just I've accepted that it's just kind of going to be that way because we live in the freelance world of filmmaking where every criminal thinks that they have an opportunity to make a buck uh so I think there's always something like that personality wise but there was nothing crazy. I mean, that forgetting that one day, I was like, well, we got to get this shot. Um, Whose head was on a spike the next day? <laughs> How dare they forget to shoot this? I was in such a neurotic mode because obviously <laughs> I was playing that character that it, it just, I woke up and was like, we didn't shoot that. We need to get this. Oh, like, you noticed. Was, oh, yeah. yeah, I think yeah. it was, yeah. And then what else? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, quick story from watching Hot Ones. You ever watch Hot Ones? No. interview show oh you got to watch hot ones it's great it's a youtube show where they uh, this guy sean evans in, uh, interviews people and they've got the biggest names of all time over the course of these eight years they've been doing it um they eat wings and they get increasingly hotter oh yeah, yeah I've okay you've probably yeah. seen clips because they pull gifts and things like that all the time jennifer lawrence idris elba you know there are two famous ones with like Aah! you know just because they're brutally hot wings by the time you're done yeah. with the conversation. That sounds good. But um, Austin Butler was on there, and he was telling stories about working on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And he really? wasn't aware of how Tarantino worked until they were shooting a scene, and they'd done it like a bunch of times. And uh, he was like, we're going to do it again? And Tarantino says something like, we're going to do it one more time because... And then everybody on the set, including Brad Pitt, was like, we love making movies! And then they do it again. Because that's why you're there. So, you know, when you see those people who, like, are tired of being there or don't want to – don't show up or whatever, it's like, do you love making movies? Maybe you shouldn't do this, you know? So I thought that was a really cool adage. And if, uh, you know, when I get on to my first feature, that's going to be the, the thing. I don't want to steal that – I'll steal that phrase straight up and just say, let's do it again because we love making movies. If we got a problem doing it again, why are we here? You know what I mean? Oh, man. Uh, yeah. So – yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. It's a little thing like that that I think really boosts the the morale at any given moment. You know, I, it's easy to get lost in being tired in the moment, I think, on, on any given day. But when you have somebody, especially like the director leading the charge like that, I think little things like that do make a huge difference. Yeah, Butler said he was like, wait, what was happening? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're all yelling at him. And then, of course, <laughs> They're yelling at me. the what? next day he's like, we love me. <laughs> he's shouting it out too. So. Um, Tell me about the film festival run. I know good things came out of Durango. Did uh, Eddie win Best Supporting Actor? Like, what happened? <laughs> That's a teddy bear for those who are unaware. Uh, he was nominated. Um, <laughs> uh, it's great. And robbed, expression. clearly. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, Durango was just, I mean, I had never, I didn't even know what to expect. It's it's a really well-supported festival. They, they create an atmosphere that is 
so much fun that it's like I, you just kind of want to go back every year. Um, it's this great little town, and I guess it's like people kind of know about it, but it's not blown out of proportion. Like I think obviously, like you know, Park City is at this point. But I walked into a Starbucks the second day I was there, and the girl behind the counter was like, "Oh, Harrison Ford was here like an hour ago." And you're just like, "This what?" I mean, we're in Durango, Colorado. And then the festival, I mean, a ton of local support. I ended up hanging out and drinking a lot with the uh, sheriff of <laughs> Durango County. <laughs> um, it was a really good time. We invited him to the after party. I, it ended up winning. It was up for best feature, and then it was up for best lead actor in a feature, and they were unanimous with best lead actor. So... Um, we graciously Congrats, accepted yeah. that. Thank you. And, um, and it's one, I think I don't, I forget the numbers, but I think out of seven festivals that it's been in, it's gotten six awards or f like five awards and one, um, um, honorable mention or something. That's pretty good. Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah, for me, I, I put shorts into festivals and you just run out of money after a while submitting. It oh, doubles yeah. the budget of the whole film. <laughs> yeah. So honestly, you know, I mean, the way some of these uh, fests charge, the good ones, and for good reason. I just went to Telluride, also a small uh, oh. festival in the mountain town where you're like, you know, why would these celebrities be here? And then you see how gorgeous it is and you go, yeah, of course, they're here because it's right. beautiful and we're having a good time. But um, the caliber, you know, of films I saw there yeah. is so high. Yeah, you're going to pay to join this group. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah. But it still is, is cost, cost you after a while. And, the, and Durango is interesting because they really are, and I think a lot of festivals say this, they really are, they want to screen truly what they feel are the best movies. It's It doesn't matter, I don't know, like, if Paul Rudd is in it, right? Paul Rudd's in a ton of, if he's in it, like it, there, you, 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 maybe there's a, a film that's like a different or more unique story. They're going to take that over the one with like the celebrity bang. Like they're very much stay true to, we want great, interesting, unique, independent films. And it's every festival says that, but then there's, I think very few that actually kind of stick with that. Um, so yeah, and then we're screening at Fort Lauderdale Film Festival this coming week. It's still out to some festivals because we just hit the, you know, we targeted X amount to submit to, and then the distribution deal kind of came together uh, faster than I expected. Um, but the did festival a, run's a, been great. Like, did a uh, distribution company come in then and, and put this everywhere I said it was, which it's everywhere, Google Play, yeah, YouTube, you name it, you can go. And again, the freebies are to be, and Roku channel, but did some uh, company like, yeah, we got Gravitas it. Ventures or so who came aboard and like, uh, we yeah we beat around the bush with Gravitas, a couple other places, but um, Syndicato was the one that came along and we felt like it was gonna get a good little home, and they were gonna you know it, it was gonna get some extra push from them, and so uh, I'm just really excited to find that it has a home and the, and a, the reception on the festival circuit is kind of crazy because you know you, you t go on this endeavor and it's been a four-year trip for us and at the time that you create it you think wow this is something that i'm gonna i'm gonna sit with for the years it's gonna take to do it because i really believe in it but along that four-year path there's so much of scraping to get by and scraping to get it over the finish line and you know i had to sit there and learn premiere for a minute to try and edit the credits right the, the stuff like that where you fail you just lose sight of this is something that could be impactful and make a difference. And then when people see it and they do respond to it, it's really refreshing to remember that everything that you fought for, for the integrity of it, or, you know, especially when you needed that extra shot or really wanted to put this story element in there and people appreciate it, respond to it, then it's the, that's like the most gratifying thing. So seeing it get that love on the festival circuit reminds you again of like, what you fought for was worth it. It's it's a unique story that a like like a studio wouldn't tell this story. A studio doesn't care about things like that, and they don't not going to take the time to tell a story that's maybe this intentional or has these type of elements to it. So, see that's what I was saying before. But it's but people will watch it at home. I don't understand. So then you know if they're watching it that much at home, I don't know why they don't get behind those stories more so in the theaters. But. Um, but it's everywhere for you to watch, as I mentioned, and I think you just gave us a good uh, 
final statement there, talking about how the hard work uh, yields rewards. But I will ask before we go what you're working on now. I am working on a feature film currently titled Exodus that I have. Uh, ver- I'm very excited about where the script is right now. It's um, It definitely tackles a sort of similar subject in the mental health area. I mean, this one is a little bit more focused on depression and things that I think a lot of people went through during the pandemic. Um, but it's all framed through an adventure story in the woods. Uh, so it is very unique. I've gotten a lot of great feedback on the script and now it's just like beating down the doors to find people who will invest enough money to put the, put the pieces together to go shoot it. Cool. And I hope, uh, I hope you find them and I hope they say, yeah, you can make that for the budget you want. Right? <laughs> That's what we're hoping for. Uh, so that wraps another TMG interview. Follow us on Twitter at the Movie Guys, Facebook, the Movie Guys, Instagram, the Movie Guys, YouTube, everywhere, iTunes, you name it, uh, for all our nonsense, uh, daily jokes and links and all sorts of stuff. Thanks to Mark Elias, and I know you can follow Boy Makes Girl on Instagram at Boy Makes Girl. Yes. Yeah. Anywhere else? Any other plugs or anything you want to bring up? Uh, Instagram Boy Makes Girl. It's Amazon and iTunes uh, where you have the opportunity to write a review for it. Uh, I would say um, take a look, watch it, enjoy it. And Golden Boy is also on Prime Video, right? Golden Boy is on it. Prime, Google Play. Am- I think Golden Boy is on all of the same platforms. I was worried when he went into the poker game. It's like, is he going to get some Golden Boy trouble here? Because that would be just a <laughs> There's dark the turn for this movie to <laughs> <Yes>. make. <laughs> it's in every film that I make. <laughs> and, of course, look for you on a dozen or so episodes of 911 Lone Star. I believe it's on Hulu. You can go check out yeah. your work there. Yep. He had a big arc with the character. And, of course, themovieguys.net for more interviews uh, with filmmakers, comedians, you name it, hundreds of podcasts, articles, reviews, and more. All right. Thank you, Mark, and thanks, everyone. Thank you.